Hey, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first NAPSIG Foundation Prep Tech Talk of 2024, Locating Justice, the Power of GIS in Law Enforcement. I hope that is what you're here for. Uh, bear with us as we move from Zoom to Teams. Uh, you're all kind of our guinea pigs, so if you have any questions or any issues, feel free to dump those questions in the chat for us um, if you're having some technical issues. Uh, I am Kevin Kay from Naptic Foundation, and I will be your moderator today. So due to large attendance, uh, everyone should be muted and does not have the ability to turn on and off their camera. Um, but we do have the Q&A functionality enabled. Uh, you should see a test message in there from me. So feel free to access your Q&A feature here and put in your questions. Uh, our two presenters today will try their best to answer all questions uh, as we go along. And then we have a couple minutes at the end to respond to any outstanding questions. If we don't get to them all, we'll make sure that we follow up directly afterwards. Uh, and then after the webinar, as always, the recording and slides will be available. Uh, if you registered through our registration page, you should get an email that says the recording is available. Um, but we'll also send out a direct email to you with all of the materials and the link to our events page of our NAPSIC Foundation website. Uh, all questions will also be kind of transcribed over to a quick fact sheet, so you'll see what all the other attendees had asked. High-level agenda, uh, and then I'll get out of the way, I promise. Uh, I'll give a quick introduction about NAPSIC Foundation. This is uh, one of our uh, long time coming law enforcement GIS prep tech talks. And so I hazard guess that we have a lot of new attendees. So we'll give you a really quick rundown of NAPSIC Foundation. Uh, then I'll throw it over to Shelby and Matt, who will talk through the bulk of our content today about the use of GIS in law enforcement. And then finally, we'll do a quick closeout and any remaining Q&A questions. So with that, uh, who are we and uh, what do we do? So. NAPSIC Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was founded, as you could see some of those organizations below. Uh, we are now running 20,000 plus strong of public safety officials, operators, and GIS staff. And that's mostly in the US, but it's also international. So if you've been to any of our previous events in person, you'll always see a good group of folks from the international community. Uh, best for everyone on the call, everything that we do, training, tools, and best practices are all available at no cost. So we really try to stay within our core mission, uh, which is to advance geospatial technology and capabilities for and with the public safety community. Everything we do is an actual operational need and is informed by you on the ground and people doing the work. Then we foster the adoption of said geospatial tools, uh, best practices for planning, daily operations, and disasters. So blue sky and gray sky, we have training, we have exercises, and we have incident support. And finally, we bridge the gaps across agencies and disciplines to better protect the communities they serve. We see a lot of cool stuff happening in law enforcement, fire, EMS, 911, and we always want to make sure that we uh, kind of proliferate those best practices across different disciplines. So how do we do it? So we start off with some national guidelines and standards. All these can be found on our NAPSIC Foundation website, uh, and that is always built with the community involvement. So uh, SMEs from law enforcement fire, depending on what we're working on, will provide input into those national guidelines and standards. We also, as previously mentioned, do exercises and simulations. We have sandboxes, which are an exact duplication of our operational tools for people to use in a no-fault environment. Then things like the Prep Tech Talk, our annual Inspired Conference, that's our education and training. We do that to build capacity and in using innovative technology because our community members help each other out. And then last but not least, which is very important, we do some limited tech assistance of transferring knowledge and skills. Um, we're always there to help folks out, especially during disasters. So that is a quick rundown of who we are. Who are you on the call? Um, so 163 total participants registered. Uh, we're getting close to the 100 number. This is fantastic. Super happy to see that we have a huge law enforcement representation here. Um, you can see down there in the bottom left. So uh, a good amount of 
not only GIS managers and GIS technologists that support law enforcement, but also probably some crime analysts out there. Uh, and you're across the entire country. So thank you all for joining us today. And with that, uh, I would love to throw it over to Shelby and Matt. Uh, very honored to have them speak to you today. Uh, and they will introduce themselves and go on with the prep tech talk. So thank you. And please put your questions in the Q&A. Shelby and Matt. Thanks, Kevin. All right, so Kevin introduced this a little bit, but um, I am Shelby Robertson. I'm the GIS manager for Montgomery County, Maryland uh, Police Department. So I do all sorts of things from analysis to licensing to managing our server technology, um, kind of like a jack of all trades for GIS. Um, and then I have with me Matt. Matt can introduce himself. Yeah, so hello, my name is Matt Harris. I come from the Santa Rosa Police Department uh, here in California, where I work as a crime analyst. And I'm aware that there may be a lot of people on this call that aren't aware of uh, what a crime analyst is or the crime analysis field. So just for a quick overview, uh, generally our profession uh, revolves around taking the mass amounts of data that we receive uh, in the police agency and helping to turn that into knowledge that we can use for uh, decision making that could be related to administrative work, uh, strategic work, uh, or actual tactical work that we're doing on the ground to help uh, solve a case. And so I'll give a couple examples of that as we go through the slide. All right, thank you. Okay, I pressed advance. Somebody else has to do it. <laughs> Here we go, here we go. <laughs> okay, so we just wanted to give you a little bit of background about our agencies before we get started. Um, so Montgomery County, we are a large county right outside Washington, DC. So we have a big department, 1300 sworn, um, 507 square miles and over a million people. And then in contrast, Matt in California, he's working for a city. So it is a much smaller department um, they've got 41 square miles and 177,000 people. Um, but I think you'll see that we're still doing similar things with our GIS. So um, you can do this for a range of departments. Okay, so just to give a little bit of a quick outline, um, first we're going to talk about you know why why we even use GIS and what is its use case in law enforcement. Um, and then we're both going to go through some examples of what we do with GIS in our departments. So I'm going to start off with um, the simple, maybe like less licensing required uh, examples and then get into the more complicated, more licensing required. Uh, then once we're done with the examples, I'll take it back and just say a few notes about data since it's really the foundation of everything that we're talking about. Um, and then I just have a list of some caveats and issues and then we can take your questions. Okay, so why is GIS and mapping so important? Um, this can really be related to anything, but um, in terms of law enforcement, like nearly everything we're doing has a where component. So you have your incident data coming from your computer aided dispatch, your CAD. Uh, you have your records management system, and that has crime information. Um, you have random data that has addresses, or say you're divided into beats and regions and districts. Like most of what you're doing there is a spatial or where component to it so in that data if you have x y coordinates or addresses which most likely you already do with something you're collecting um, you can really take advantage of that using gis um, you can do things like identify patterns or trends or correlations so i'm sure matt does a lot of that with crime analysis um, looking like where the crimes are happening uh, you can do things like predictive analysis uh, it provides data-driven insights for things like resource allocation. So uh, where should we put additional officers? Or if we're having trouble in one area, it's a lot easier to see that if you're looking at on GIS. Um, also, like say you need to build a new police station, where's the best place to, to build it? Um, you can look at things like demographic data, socioeconomic status, um, all of that can be combined in the GIS and give a lot of insights for law enforcement. Okay, so today we're gonna to be talking mostly about ArcGIS Enterprise, which I'll call Portal, and ArcGIS Online. And 
and the key word here is GIS is online. So the reason that we're moving towards more online or web GIS is because uh, if you make a static PDF or an image map, you print it, it's outdated the moment it's created, right? Like you don't have a live feed of data. Nothing's getting updated unless you go in and manually update it. And I know in law enforcement, I get a ton of requests for paper maps. And what I try and do is say, you know, I'll make you a paper map, but can I also give you a complimentary online one? And you can see, you know, that, that you can get more use out of it probably. So they can do things like zoom in and out, click on information and get pop-ups, um, symbolize with different colors. You can control when things turn on and off, different layers, you can label things. So you can just do a lot more than you can with even a really big paper map. So it also gives the power to the end user, user through functional applications. So things like, you know, dashboards or where, where an officer or someone in your agency can go and they can get information from an application that you've built without having to ask you for it. So it's really like self-service. Um, and then another great thing about using Portal or Arches Online is, you know, with law enforcement, like we care about security. Um, so we can control a lot of the security of our data. We can centralize our data. We can make sure everyone's seeing the same thing. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more in detail after the examples. Okay, so many of you are probably familiar um, in law enforcement. A lot of a lot of agencies do something called a crime stat or a comp stat meeting. Uh, we do ours once a week, and it's basically everybody gets in a room and they want to see like where the big incidents have happened this week or the big crimes, things like that. So I was actually hired seven years ago because they needed someone to make a map just for this meeting. So we didn't have a lot of GIS at the time. I mean, we had me, but we didn't have like a lot of licensing. So we had um, an Arctis online license, no portal, no enterprise, anything like that. And I could have made them PDFs every week so that they could show like in a PowerPoint. But instead, I really wanted to start leveraging web GIS at the agency. So what I ended up doing is in Arches Online with my one license, um, I was able to create a map that they use in the MC stat meeting that pulls from our CAD and our RMS data. Um, it's a simple script that updates the data once a week. Uh, I built it with Arches Web App Builder for those of you who are familiar with building these types of applications. Um, and what's neat about it is I hosted it in Arches online and no one has to log in to see it. So that does sound scary, um, but I stripped all the PII out of it. So there's no publicly accessible or it is publicly accessible data. There's nothing private in here. If you zoom in, it's like to the block rounding. Um, but the important thing is I got an interactive map in front of our command staff and, you know, that got them asking questions like, oh, well, I want to see all the incident details. Uh, I want to be able to do this, that and that. And so just from like that one little investment, I could say, well, if we go to enterprise, if we buy more licenses, if we do X, Y and Z, you know, you show the art of the possible of what you can do with GIS um, so that that. I highly suggest if you just need somewhere to start. OK, Matt also has um, a crime stat map. Do you just want to say a few words about this one? Yeah, so we um, and first off, I got to say thanks, Shelby, because you're hitting all the key points and you might see me nodding here. You, you've gone through all the same experiences that we have here at Santa Rosa Police Department and uh, really um, our map here for stat map isn't hosted on ArcGIS Online, it's hosted in our portal. So, um, but we did a similar approach is we made it inside the portal publicly accessible so that anybody who has access in the portal doesn't need an ArcGIS login account. They just uh, go right to it, they get the map there. And then here we can share a little bit more info, but because of the way that our network works, we still keep the PII out. Um, and um, the one major difference that I think that we have on here and what you may see uh, from our map uh, versus okay. yours is that we're allowing uh, the querying of whether it be dispatch events, our incidents, our arrests. And so they have several different categories that they can choose from. 
so, but this, like yours, uh, has has drawn much more interest from those using it um, and allowing them to dig into the data on their own and actually answer or um, provide uh, information then back to the public uh, without having to come to an analyst uh, for that information. Thanks, Matt. And yeah, I just wanted to point out because we've said the terms a few times, Arctis Online and Portal are very similar, but Portal is hosted in your own infrastructure. Um, so you can put it behind your firewall, things like that. Um, Arctis Online is hosted in Esri's cloud infrastructure. So those are the two differences between that. So both Matt and I ended up eventually deploying Portal, but I started with Arctis Online. to do. Okay, somebody advance it. <laughs> no, it's not working for me either. Okay, Kevin. Okay, so going up the scale to like maybe a little more advanced um, example, we have this daily thefts from auto. So it's exactly what it sounds like. Every day this data gets updated and because people still love their PDFs, um, I just have a couple scripts that were very easy to set up and this gets emailed out as an email attachment to an email distribution list every day um, around 5 a.m. But because I wanted to push WebGIS um, in this email, you can say it also says or click here to view the interactive map. So they can easily just see a snapshot, maybe get an idea of like where we've had the most incidents the past 24 hours. But then if you want to drill in, Next slide, please. Um, we have this interactive map. So it looks similar to the PDF. It's the same exact data. It's coming from the same source, um, but you can go in and interact with it. So you can view details about individual incidents. Um, you can come in here and export the table so that you have a CSV that you can do your own analysis with. Um, we have it set up so that if you click in the pop-up and scroll down, you can see, you can actually have a link that goes directly to the CAD incident or the RMS incident page um, if you're logged in and have uh, access to that. For this one too, and, and for a lot of the apps that I've built, um, I wanna point out that I used Arcgis Web App Builder, which was the latest and greatest up until a couple of years ago. Um, it is going to be retired in 2025 and it's being replaced by Experience Builder. So if any of you know what I'm talking about, um, I would highly encourage you to start making new applications um, in Experience Builder, and that's what I'm doing too. Let's see if this works. Oh, yay. Uh, okay, Matt. All right, and so what we're demonstrating here is again, a similar, uh, relatively simple map that we created for our agency to share where our vehicle thefts were happening and then again, where they've been recovered. This is something that's always uh, been a challenge for us in at least uh, from my experience as an analyst in law enforcement because of the way that the data is often collected in the records management system. So uh, luckily we have a auto theft task force here in the county and they are collating all this information from various uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, including ours and the California Highway Patrol and other allied agencies in the region. And so, um, this data is actually being maintained by a person at that auto theft task force rather than pulling it from our records management system. So this is just a, one more example, I guess, of showing how that data can be displayed uh, to the end user. OK, so now moving up to maybe a little bit more complicated. Um, this is what we call our Tactical Crime Information Center, or we call it the TCIC. So this is built in ArcGIS dashboards. Dashboards are very popular as end user applications. Um, I actually 
we wanted to make sure that we put a disclaimer on this dashboard so that whenever people come and use the data, and this is really important for any application, they know exactly what they're looking at. They know what data you're using. They know what it's filtered by. They know if you're using the report date or the start date. That stuff's you know, not that fun, but it's really important to put up front. Um, so I have this splash screen that shows up. I did this by embedding it in Experience Builder because splash screens are not part of dashboards yet, at least in Portal. Um, and then the person just has to agree that they understand the conditions and then they can go into the map. So once they're in, oops, once they're in the dashboard, um, they can go in and filter on all, all sorts of things. So uh, select a category, you know, different types of burglaries. Right here, I have selected auto thefts. You can select your district. You can do a date range if you want to. Um, and when you select something, all the different graphics update based on what you've selected. So here we have 550 auto thefts in District 1. You can see them on a map. You can click on any of them and get more information. Um, and you can also kind of do like statistics on the fly. Um, I don't have any baked into here where you can see the numbers, but I do have these charts where um, if you're interested in like your top three beats where you have the most activity happening for what you filtered, this will automatically change based on what you're filtering. Um, right now, dashboards and portal don't allow a CSV export, uh, but that that's in Arches Online and it's coming to Enterprise. So we are going to add that um, to the next iteration of this. Okay, so another application that gets just a ton of uh, use and was very simple to put together is another dashboard. This is our open calls for service. So these are near real time. It's correcting or it's connecting di directly to a view of our CAD system. Um, and it is exactly what it looks like. So you can see the open calls for service. You can click on any of these things and the rest of the charts will update. Um, I have them color coded by priority type. So say you're only interested in priority type one, you can just display that. Uh, and this is really useful again for situational awareness, command staff, just to know like what's going on with the department at all times. Okay, so what I've talked about mostly up until now is using data that's existing, it's in your RMS, it's in your CAD. Matt had mentioned, um, you know, he is somebody putting in his own data. So we also use that, we use GIS heavily to collect our own data. So we use ArcGIS Survey123. Um, you can do forms and data collection. So we have it for honestly so many programs, but it has a lot of cool features. So like we have this one program where um, we will etch the VIN number of someone's car into their catalytic converter. And if it gets stolen, then we know where it came from. We at least know what car it came from. And what's cool about that is if you type in a VIN number to sur survey one, two, three, it has a VIN decoder built into it. So it auto, auto populates, you know, make, model, year, whatever. We use it for things. Um, I'm actually working on a big project right now. We're switching our field interview reports. Um, over to survey one, two, three. So the officers will have them on their phone when they're out. If they stop somebody, if they interview them, uh, they fill out all sorts of information. But then what's also cool is they can scan their driver's license and it pre-populates everything that's that the DMV has. Um, other, you know, we, we use it for non-spatial stuff. For example, if you go to our website and you want to fill out a complaint or a compliment, that form is actually built in survey one, two, three. Um, I'm going to talk about the security camera program in a second. Um, and then, yeah, we we use it for internal things. We use it for public things, signups for ride alongs. Um, there's a there's a ton of potential with survey one, two, three. And this data all gets collected and you have the option to put it in your own databases. So then it lives with the rest of your data and you can um, do everything else that you can link it to your CAD data, your RMS, whatever. OK, so my last example is kind of like putting it all together. So this is uh, from from the beginning, a fully GIS project. So uh, we have a program in the county with the police department where residents can uh, register their private security cameras with the department. So like a ring camera or something they got on Amazon and they get up to two hundred fifty dollars 
per camera as a rebate. And they just have to agree that, you know, if there's a crime and we, we come ask for it, they don't actually have to share it with us, but we know where the cameras are and they can share that data with us if they would like to. So first off, this started because we had to figure out, okay, well, we don't want all the areas in the county being able to register. We just want to prioritize like high crime locations. So desktop GIS came in handy for this. So I did an analysis in ArcGIS Pro, looking at like the number of incidents um, based on a grid around the county. And I ended up making an experience builder and sending this to all of our command staff and decision makers so that they could go district by district and look and see which areas are hot spots for crime and then they all got together and were able to come up with a list of priority areas where they wanted people to be able to register their security cameras so that's step one so then getting that to the public if you go to the website there's an i am i eligible page and that links to this this is an arcgis instant app and all the uh, the resident has to do is type in their address and it'll say very easily, like you're not eligible or you are eligible. Um, so that weeds out a lot of people in the first place that aren't, you know, coming in in ineligible areas. So then if they are eligible, they go to the form. Um, and then we have other checks and balances here too. So they fill out their information. But in survey one, two, three, you can say, okay, well, it's not in an eligible location. So this is another check that we don't get bad data. Um, they have to live in the county or else they're not going to be able to submit. So they go through this big form, um, they fill everything out, they submit it, they attach pictures, and then they get an email. And this is done through um, Power Automate, which also hooks in with Survey123. Um, and it attaches the report from Survey123 and sends it to the citizen um, as well as internally and says, hey, your registration has been submitted. Here's a PDF of it. Any questions, contact us. So then the next step is internally, we have to verify that these are actually legit applications so that, you know, somebody didn't submit a picture of their cat. Like it has to be a real receipt and all that. So we have, I have actually additional surveys built on the same data where employees can go and verify and approve. And it goes through this whole long process um, to determine whether that the, the person is eligible for the rebate. So I use a combination of dashboards here. I have this experience builder where everybody can go in and they can see, okay, which ones are approved, which ones are awaiting review. You can see like what the statuses are. Um, and then the last piece is a dashboard. This one's actually publicly available. This one is shared with our county council. Um, it's gonna be on the website. And this, again, everything's pulling from that one, one same data table so this shows the number of applications submitted approved versus denied you can look at property type police district council district um the, you know we're really interested in the amount of funds that it's used up because there's only i think 250,000. um so we have to know like when to stop the program and then there's a heat map of where people have registered um and again it's public so you can't zoom in and see the exact location but you can kind of see um the general area so that's from start to finish, everything in this project was done with GIS. All right, Matt's turn. All right, well, again, I love seeing what you've done there. And uh, I like how, you know, again, we've done things in parallel. So uh, we, uh, we have very similar uh, dashboards that we've set up here that weren't displayed in that slide as well. And then here at Santa Rosa Police Department, um, or we have a camera registry that we've initiated as well. Not necessarily um, the similar model where uh, citizens are getting paid to do the, or, or get the, uh, the funds to buy the cameras, but they have the ability to register th at, through Survey123. And one of the reasons why I bring that up is because when Survey123 was kind of initially coming out, my reaction was, okay, well, that's nice, but I don't really see myself using Survey123 and conducting a lot of citizen surveys uh, with the department. Now, there are occasions when which we may do that, and I just didn't see it as a, like a primary focus of uh, what we've done. But then after seeing how we implemented it with the camera registry and then furthermore seeing how uh, Esri's um, 
solutions team has built it into some of the dashboards that they've released, it really spurred some ideas uh, for me to build further into what we've done here at Santa Rosa Police Department. So I'm going to start off by showing uh, a tool that was really based on a solution that was provide, provided by Esri. And then we'll move into something that uh, we I then further created here at Santa Rosa based off uh, a need that we have kind of uh, to solve some property crime stuff. So the first, first one I want to show is the patrol beat dashboard. And this came from an idea from our chief who wanted to see monthly beat reports. And he wanted to be able to see what's going on in each beat and uh, what are the areas where most crime is happening and how can we work to prevent that crime from happening in the future. So we, be, we built out those uh, monthly reports and they were a static piece of paper. And that really limited us to what we were gonna be able to show uh, to those to the officers and, and how much they were gonna then be able to do with those beat reports. And by the way, Kevin, I think I'll be able to uh, manage the slides myself. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll be good. And I'm good on this one. And so with those beat reports, we were able to show, you know, focus areas for a given beat or, or patrol, but we didn't get, we weren't able to go further into detail where the officer was able to then click on each of the individual incidents. And you can see on the slide here, uh, they, this is, uh, they've clicked on an incident and that's where a robbery had occurred uh, back in February. And, and so they could then read more about that individual report and know more about it. Also here on, on the beat report, they could see a prior uh, 36 months worth of data for violence or, or property crimes or, or traffic uh, collisions that had occurred in that specific focus area. Then one other thing that we're able to offer in this dashboard was the ability for the sergeant and the lieutenant who are in charge of that focus area to say, what's the problem that's happening here? What are our goals for trying to solve this problem? What strategies are we going to use to, to address it? And what resources are out there? What best practices are out there from other law enforcement agencies? What uh, what known solutions uh, to some of the problems that we're seeing. And so uh, this shows how we're able to provide that communication directly to the patrol officers who are working that beat. They can see, okay, here I have this beat. Inside the beat, there's you know these six different problems. The one that we're going to focus on is this one here called Cotting Town Center. And this is the, the methods, the strategies we're going to use to focus on, on that problem. So it really took our ability to show what we were trying to show on a single piece of paper and provide so much more information in an interactive map. Okay, and Kevin, I am going to need you to transfer the slide because I don't have the ability to change it. I apologize. So then once we deployed this out, we started getting so much more feedback from our officers, from our sergeants and our lieutenants. They said, hey, we need to be able to use this to manage complaints that are coming in from the citizens as well. And so here we added a whole nother page onto the dashboard that allow them to say, OK, we have a traffic complaint in this neighborhood and this is uh, how we want to address it from a patrol perspective and how we're communicating that information then out to our officers. And so we then were able to expand our use beyond these long term focus areas to these kind of short term complaints. And we built out a very similar thing. And one thing that I'll point out on here is you see uh, maybe at the bottom uh, right of the overview of the complaint that's happening, there's a little email icon that also gives the ability for the uh, officer or the sergeant to take that information and throw it right into an email and make sure that that information is communicated clearly across the department. Uh, we'll go ahead and switch to the next. And so additionally, uh, they wanted to be able to know OK, well, the chief's asking me to be proactive. He wants me to go out and shake hands with people in the community. He wants me to make sure I'm doing proactive enforcement in these focus areas or in these complaints. And so the sergeants wanted to be able to see, OK, well, where are our officers doing their proactive activity or where are the events that our officers can go to and meet with the citizens and meet with the businesses and, and do this? And so 
we then moved on and added this proactive or community oriented policing tab that allows us to be able to see where our proactive activity is and where the the proactive conduct is is being con conducted i'll go ahead and move along then uh further uh what our officers on the streets really wanted to be able to know as well is so say um and this happened in february we had in the area of that cotting town center which is kind of displayed there at the the center of the map we had a series of uh vehicle thefts in and around that neighborhood and those uh, vehicle thefts were all Kias or Hondas where they'd smash the window and break into the car and rip the ignition apart and, and then steal the vehicle. And so uh, we wanted to be able to conduct a proactive patrol, you know, let our officers know, well, who are the known offenders that live in that area? Who are the, the property crime offenders? And so we have this uh, portion of the map that allows them to go in and see people with different alerts or offender notifications that may be on their name record and find out, are they on a felony uh, warrant for their arrest or they have probation with search terms? And so then we can see, okay, here we have a felony formal probationer who's a committed cr property crime in the past. And so there's a person that may be worth kind of talking to or finding out uh, what they're up to. So this gives the officer that additional um, resource to be proactive and, and take action uh, rather than just knowing, oh, there's busy stuff around Cottingtown. Then uh, furthermore, the officers uh, followed up with me and said, oh, this is great, but you know, I want to be able to know where our security cameras are in town or where do we have license plate readers uh, in case I have an event that happens, a, a burglary at somebody's house or uh, a theft that happens. And I want to be able to see, can I identify a, a getaway vehicle or a vehicle that's associated with it with a license plate? And so our camera registry, even though it's uh, in its infancy, uh, those cameras will show up on this map as they're registered. And um, here we also have the license plate readers that are installed throughout our city that are displaying on the map there as well. And so then uh, the final thing that we show on this dashboard and the next slide is our response uh, strategies. This is kind of a, um, a research tool that we're just providing uh, to the officers, the sergeants and lieutenants, the ability to go find those best practices in law enforcement, see the evidence-based uh, um, practices, whether they've worked, whether they've not worked, um, see what other law enforcement agencies have been doing to try and get this uh, and, and use the smartest possible practices. And so, it really collates all the information that a patrol beat sergeant who's responsible for a small geographic area needs to move from a reactive response in law enforcement where we're constantly just sitting around and waiting for the next report to come in to being more proactive and taking initiatives to be involved in those areas where we're being impacted, where people are being victimized. So we'll move on to the next set. So that uh, prior dashboard that I'd shown you was all kind of stemmed from the uh, solution that was provided through the Esri Solutions tool. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move through the slides. But what it gave me was the idea that I can not only use the information that's coming from my records management system or my dispatch system, but I can have a data entry point through survey one, two, three, where we're gathering that additional info. And that's what we had seen in the side panels where it gives the officer, you know, the ability to put in what their response is going to be. The sergeant can say, these are our goals, what we want to achieve in that area. And so once we, I kind of had that concept of, oh, I can use these surveys internally and build them directly into the dashboard. So you're seeing the responses right in the, in, in the um, product that you're using. Gave me the idea to think, ah, I can build out a whole new product of something that we could use. And that's where I came up with the idea of this property crime review panel. 
And so myself and the other analysts that work at the police department, we are going to use we use this review panel to look at all our events and reports that have happened related to property crime, clean them up and make them into something that we can use to track our trends, our patterns and our series to make sure that we're on top of what's happening so we can communicate with our detectives uh, the latest things that are going on. So we'll move to the next slide and we'll get a good look at it. So we just have the ability to see what's going on on a daily basis and data that comes in here, we see it from two different sources and I've merged those sources into, into a single uh, interface so that if anybody who's aware how law enforcement works is we initially get the call in a dispatch system. And that just uh, indicates that we've sent an officer out and they evaluate whether they're gonna actually write a report or not write a report. Um, and so that dispatch call will come in and it may take a couple days or if the officer goes on vacation, sometimes it may take up to a couple of weeks to get that report finally approved. And so then once the report's finally approved, then you'll get much more rich detail information about it. Well, we wanted to be able to see that information as soon as possible. So we wanted to be able to see the call information and then overwrite it with the report information once that came out. And so uh, on the left hand side here, you see all of the reports or the calls that have come in, where they took place, what they were for. And we'll, uh, as the crime analyst, look through those on a daily basis, review them, and then we may tag them with one of the tags that you see kind of in the lower right hand panel. So for a pattern, series, or trend, or we may add additional notes to that call. So as we move to the next slide, you'll actually see this is the survey one, two, three form or a portion of that survey one, two, three form where we as the analysts are going in and saying, that crime that we just looked at on the review panel is part of this series. It's a red Chevy Camaro, and we've been having a lot of recent Chevy Camaro or high-end uh, performance vehicle thefts in our city. And so we can tag it as one of those related crimes, say we're pretty high certainty about it. And then the next slide will show that once you move back into the property crime review panel, if we were to click on those high performance car thefts in the lower right hand corner, what it will do is filter down the data that we see on the left hand side to show only those high performance uh, vehicle thefts. So now we're seeing the data with the added notes that we've put in on those uh, vehicle thefts and we're seeing um, the map of where those thefts have occurred and help us kind of better focus any proactive efforts we wanna to take to try and prevent those from happening in the future. And I believe that covers me and it's back to you, Shelby. Great, thank you. Those are super interesting examples. Um, okay, so now I wanna talk about data like we've teased a few times um and really and i think we're actually getting a lot of questions about data data structure in the chat um data is the foundation of everything that we're talking about so um it's really important that you know your data so like from the basics of what tables and fields do you have available and like your field types um how do your tables relate to each other what sources are they coming from where are your gaps and you might not know these answers, um, but somebody in your agency does. So it's really important to make connections with your database administrator or your IT person, or if you have a GIS person, um, to see what you have to work with and then start bringing those things together to build these types of applications. Um, the second and a, a huge point is to centralize your data. So, you know, don't don't have a bunch of access databases everywhere where people are just collecting disparate data and they're not sharing and they're not linking. Um, you know, really try and leverage your existing relational database management system. So your CAD, your RMS, um, make sure that these are all coming from the same source. So databases are great because you can have structured storage, easy access to vast amounts of data, and then users can quickly retrieve and query 
accurate and timely information. So accurate is really important. You know that if you're putting out an application and someone else on a different team or whatever is putting out an application, that the data that's feeding both of those is coming from the same place so that there's no discrepancy. Um, it's also important that you control what's coming in where you can. So this was important with um, if you're collecting your own data or survey one, two, three, um, you know, there's not so much we can do about like if an officer writes a report and puts in not so great data, uh, we can educate on why it's important that they they put better data in. Um, but we can also when we're at least building our own applications, we can completely stop bad data from coming in. So, for example, for my security camera project, if you live outside a priority area or outside the county, you can't even submit any data. Um, you can do things like pick lists. So if you have a drop down and you have states and you choose a state instead of having someone type in a state and then you get, you know, six different ways to spell Maryland. Um, so you can reduce human error. You make it nearly impossible to input mistakes. And then this also really streamlines workflows. Like not everyone needs to see every question in a survey. If they answered no to something, then they can skip, you know, automatically the next a set of questions. Um, so that makes it easier for the person that's putting in the data. They're not bogged down by things that they don't need to see. And then for law enforcement, um, obviously it's really important to secure your data. Um, so we have CJIS compliance, um, some things that we do in Montgomery County. So like for our ArcGIS portal, and you can do this with ArcGIS online too, you can set it up with your single sign on. So your active directory. So our officers, they log in with the same username and password that they log in to any of the county systems. It has multi-factor authentication. Uh, and then once they're in, they can only see things that are shared with them. So you can do groups of content. You can share things with groups. You can share with the whole organization. You can share publicly. Um, but it is really important to have a good grasp on that because if you do get access to the data and you do have the power to put it out there, you have to be aware of what you're putting out. So you don't want to accidentally publish a ton of PII data and have it on a public facing website. Um, so, you know, we make it seem kind of easy to just like throw this all together, but a lot of time and decisions go into setting up applications like this. Um, some other thing that uh, I think we both really find useful is, especially now, it's so easy to automate as much as you can. So if you're doing anything where, you know, you're doing the same task over and over multiple times a day or a week or whatever, you can probably automate it. Um, in GIS, you can use tools like Model Builder, um, Python, you can schedule tools to run in ArcGIS Pro and they go through Windows Task Scheduler. Um, I have a bunch of jobs that are managed in SQL Server Management Studio and they kick off based on, you know, once a week or once a day or whatever. Uh, you saw with the security camera, we're using a lot of email triggers. So somebody submits something, then an email gets sent. Um, I'm using Power Automate. There's also something called make.com um, that hooks up really nicely with ArcGIS, especially Survey123. Um, and, and that's really cool to do those types of workflows. So even if it seems daunting, like, oh, I'd never be able to do that. Like, I'm not a programmer. I don't know how to do that stuff. And um, they, they, they make it very easy. OK, so you don't have the time, you don't have the staff, you don't have the resources, budget, any of that. I totally get it. Um, I started from, like I said, one ArcGIS online license that I don't even think the county even knew that they had. Um, you really have to advocate. Like if you want to do this, you have to advocate for yourself, advocate for uh, GIS in your agency. Uh, I think it's really useful to show the art of the possible. So even if it's like sending this webinar to somebody or um, building something from scratch in ArcGIS Online and putting it out. Um, it's really great to do that kind of stuff. Like I said earlier, you know, if you have no idea about any of this structure in your agency, reach out to your IT. There's probably, you know, maybe not in the police department, but for the county or the city, a, a database administrator, you may already have a ton of GIS licenses. You might have an agreement with Esri already and you're just not using them. So definitely ask around. Um, I mentioned Esri, so it is also important to bring them in. They are super helpful and have a ton of resources for how to get started. 
um, or to make your um, deployments better. Also ask around your region. So like what are, I like to talk to my neighboring counties and like go to their websites and see what they're doing. Um, make lots of connections. And then everybody's on this webinar, but obviously training um, and keeping up to date is critical because technology and GIS changes constantly. Um, I think there's an update for ArcGIS Online every three months. So you really have to stay up to date with what's going on um, if you wanna keep pace. Okay, so caveats and challenges. Again, it you, we can make this seem like it's really easy to put all this stuff together, but it does take a lot of, you know, time and knowledge. Um, and there are some barriers, like for example, ESRI licensing. Um, I'm I say like we started with ArcGIS Align and then we went to Portal, but that took money and investment. Um, it also took negotiating. ESRI has, you know pricing for how many users are allowed to enter data into survey one, two, three. And it wasn't realistic for us that have 1300 sworn officers that all needed an account. So, you know, I talked to my account manager, explained the situation and they were willing to work with us um, where we pay for something that I think is a lot more fair for what we're doing. Um, another thing to consider is network security, firewalls. Um, you have to talk to your IT people. You really have to carefully consider how it's set up, um, you know, sieges compliance, things like that. We have ours on premise. It's in our DMZ, so um, you can access it from uh, uh, from the public, but it's also a lot of it's behind the firewall. So there's different ways that you can set up things um, to make them secure. Like I said, we use multi-factor authentication. Um, and then training, obviously, like if you could go to the user conference in San Diego for Esri, that's awesome, um, but it's super expensive. So even just doing like webinars like this, um, NAPSIG Inspire is free and it's awesome. And hopefully I'll see you there. Uh, but yeah, so that's what we have to show you today. Oh, wait, oh, one more. Esri puts out, if you know where to start, um, it's called Arctic Solutions for Law Enforcement, and they have this for emergency management and fire too. But what they've done is put together these templates um, where I don't use them from scratch, but I use them for ideas of, oh, okay, we could put together something like this police transparency app. Um, but it is really helpful if you're starting from scratch. They give you, I think, like the data model, um, how to put your data into these applications, how to publish them, all sorts of stuff. So. Um, if you don't know where to start, that is a really great resource. Now I'm done. Awesome. Thank you, Shelby and Matt. Uh, I think the biggest thing that you see is like it's not just GIS for strategic level meetings and it's not just for uh, specialized teams. You really are building kind of like operational line level tools, and then you're building on your successes to get people to really believe that GIS is not only making them more efficient and capable at their job, but also providing the needed data to do an advanced analysis. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A, and then uh, we'll wrap up. So we have about two minutes for questions. Um, so the first one was, how do you navigate ethical issues around crime mapping and predictive policing? Are there policies, training, or other guidance available to GIS supporting law enforcement? So this is Matt. I'll go ahead and start off with that. Um, and so there's a lot packed in this question, but I think uh, one thing to, to start off with is I don't believe Shelby or I are really doing a predictive policing model where we're, you know, driving our police to say, be in this specific location at this specific time, we expect a crime to occur. Um, and so um, that's one thing I think, you know, we're very careful about, about trying to do stuff uh, on, on that realm. Uh, but I do think there are also, uh, it's a good point about asking about, you know, whether there are ethical issues around crime mapping and just law enforcement in general and policies, training and guidance. Uh, so, yes, absolutely. Our agency, we're doing um, uh, implicit bias training. We have policies around um uh, you know, how our officers behave and and on all of that is is very strictly governed. 
Plus, uh, we also in California, and I think many agencies around the country have started uh, I, um, racial profiling uh, uh, initiative where after each and every event, the officers have to document uh, whether they, you know, what perceived race the person was that they interacted with. And so now we're collecting and collating all that data to see how we are performing with expectation amongst our citizens. I also think that one thing that I try to highlight in what I talked about with our apps is that we're responding to the victims and the crimes that are occurring and we're trying to help those citizens in our community. It's not as if we're, you know, out um, kind of just, you know, indiscriminately targeting neighborhoods. And so I don't I want to go too much further there, but I hope that covers that question. Yeah, and same here, pretty much exactly what you said. Um, our county is governed by, we have a county executive and a county council. There's all sorts of policies on this. We make sure to follow them. Um, yeah, when we collect information like out of stop, we have perceived race, perceived ethnicity, um, things like that. So we're just, you know, collecting the data um, and, and we respond to inquiries as they come in. Great. Uh... I think this might be for uh, both of you, but when you create your enterprise dashboards, do you also use GeoVent server and you import live CAD data? So I actually don't have to use GeoEvent for the live calls for service that we have set up. That's just a view. Um, there's not that many calls that, that are happening at one time. It's usually like 100 or less. So there's no performance issues with that. Um, but as a caveat, we are expanding our GIS infrastructure and um, we are going to get GeoEvent server. Um, the fire department's going to use it too. It's really great for if like you have a lot of data coming in fast, like for example, AVL data, automatic vehicle location. Um, because of the police union, we're not allowed to see that data, so I can't use it. Um, but yes, we are getting GeoEvent server, but no, we're not using it at the moment. And we're not using it here either. Great. Um, I think that was uh, all the Q&A questions. There was one remaining one. If somebody had examples of uh, dashboards for IMTs, incident management teams, uh, Shelby showed the solutions deployment site. They also have emergency management and incident management solutions there. So that's probably a good spot to start. Um, so I'll go ahead and wrap up real quick. Uh, Again, this year for NAPSIC Foundation, we're really trying to focus on our roots, and our roots is the traditional public safety GIS disciplines. Um, and so our next upcoming Prep Tech Talk will be on April 10th, registration coming soon, and that will be Fighting Fire with Data, the National Emergency Response Information System, or NEARIS, um, which is the new fire reporting system. Uh, and then in June, we'll do another GIS for fire analysis. August, we'll do a public safety GIS symbology. And then finally in November, we'll wrap it up with an emergency medical services GIS uh, prep tech talk. And then in the spirit of NAPSIC Foundation and some real quick tech uh, tech tips and tech transfer, for those of you who do not see the Q&A functionality uh, within this webinar, uh, according to Microsoft, if you log into a webinar via browser and you are not logged into a Microsoft account and you're external to the organization, you will not see the Q&A function. So, if you join any other webinars uh, that's using Teams and you have the same problem, we'll try to triage on our end, but appreciate everyone bearing with us as we move to a new system. Uh, so with that, if you have any questions of the presenters or myself, uh, Shelby and Matt shared their contact information. The recording and slides will be made available to you after uh, we put together the resource page. You can see my email up there. And again, just a big thank you to both Matt and Shelby for joining us today and sharing all of their knowledge of GIS in law enforcement. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks. It was an honor to be here. Thanks, everyone.